Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cantrid webinar brought to you by Kenanga Investment Bank and managed by Wellford. Today, we are very excited to be doing this topic. Malaysia Market Outlook 2023, Earnings Resilience to Weather Macro Headwinds. So welcome everybody to this uh, session. My name is Shen Chu. I'm the moderator for this uh, session. Now, this is the first Cantrid webinar for 2023, and we are very excited and glad to see you here today. Our session today will talk about what are the opportunities for 2023 and what are the sectors that will show earnings resilience that can weather through the macro headwinds. So today we are very excited to invite the head of research, Mr. Joshua Ng from Kananga Investment Bank to share us on this topic. So before we begin, as usual, disclaimer. So whatever we share in this session is only for educational purpose. So in no way that we give any recommendation for you to buy or sell any listed securities that we mentioned here. If you decide to make any investment decisions, you're 100% responsible for all your investment risks. So without further ado, let me just invite the head of research from Kananga Investment Bank, Mr. Joshua Ng, to present on this topic. So very uh, nice to see you here, Joshua. Hi, Shane. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. And you? Uh, fantastic. Uh, right. Let's get started. Perfect. Uh, shall I just proceed? Yes, you may uh, right. proceed to share your slide. All right, fantastic. Okay, we are seeing your okay, screen right now. Slide. Yes. Okay, give me a second. Huh? I just move. All right, can you see the slide uh, clearly? No, now we are seeing your desktop. Oh, sorry, yeah. There's yep. some technical issue here. Let okay, me just, just now it works. Right, for those of you who just tuned in, this is the first Cantrip webinar and we are very glad to see you today. Just give us a moment while we are putting up the slide. So Mr. Joshua Ng is a heavyweight in the research, Kananga research team. He's a head of research and today he, he's going to share with us uh, what are the opportunities in the market, what are the possible risks and what are the sectors with earnings resilience that can weather the macro headwinds. All right. All right. You? Uh, you can see my slide now, right? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay. My my head may look a little bit not so natural because I'm uh, looking a bit sideways on the screen. But anyway, uh, okay. Let's get started. Uh, basically, if you look at the title of my presentation, uh, macro headwinds and earning resilient. These are the two things uh, that you would have to watch. For 2023, uh, it could be whole of 2023 or could be part of 2023. Okay, uh, the very first thing, macro headwinds. This is the underlying assumption you have to impute into your model when it comes to investing in 2023. Uh, why is that? There is a looming recession in the US. This is something that you cannot ignore. However, uh, second thing, earnings resilient. This is how you can actually uh, outperform the market despite uh, all these macro headwinds. Um, I think uh, the new year has actually started. Uh, you've been trading the market and some people could be lucky enough to have made some money, especially this morning, uh, those who bought uh, Nation Gate would have made money. Uh, but I guess you know that uh, 2023 is not gonna be an easy year for you and not gonna be an easy year for everybody. Uh, it's going to be very tough. If I'm telling you that uh, this year is going to be hunky-dory, I am actually not even sending across the right message. So, but of course, uh, you yourself, 
uh, is an investor or you are actually advising your investors, uh, you're being given the mandate uh, to actually ask them to invest. And from your experience, you actually know that the greatest opportunities actually present themselves when fears actually rule the markets. I think uh, it is very much the situation right now. Uh, okay, the thing is that uh, we all want to invest, but we want to time uh, you know, the exact timing when we want to jump back into the market in a big way. Uh, this is not going to be easy. Uh, I think uh, you really have to consider two things here. Uh, number one, whether there is going to be a recession in the US. Number two, if there is a recession in the US, how deep and how long the recession is going to be? Because that would actually decide when you would actually jump back to the markets. And um, basically, um, you know, we do not quite have the answers to the question as to when the market is going to bottom and whether there's going to be a recession in the US. But what we can actually do is to act based on what we know at this point of time. And we will actually have to adjust our strategy and modify our investment plans along the way. So what do we know exactly uh, right now? Uh, as I mentioned to you just now, it is a strong likelihood that the US will actually slip into a recession. Um, if you look at the chart at the top, uh, that basically shows you uh, the recession in the US over the last 40 to 50 years. The gray areas uh, basically represents recession periods in the US. Since the late 80s, the Fed um, during five occasions actually embarked on rate hikes. Out of the five occasions, four of them actually resulted in a recession. And uh, the latest one, i.e. in the year 2020, you can argue that the recession was not quite because of rate hike, but because of COVID. But statistically speaking, you are talking about four over five, 80% chance that US will actually slip into a recession after the Fed actually raised rates. And this time around, if you look at the chart, you look how steep is the curve. It's actually the steepest ever since the 1970s. So that gives you a good idea as to how likely the US is going to slip into a, re a recession. And uh, based on historical data, normally the recession will actually hit about nine to 18, 18 months after the rates in the US actually peaked. So when the rate is going to peak, if you look at uh, the table at the top, uh, this is basically the uh, Fed fund futures uh, traded live in the US. Market at this point is looking at uh, US rates to peak around March this year at 5%. So assuming the rate is to peak in March, so the recession may actually hit towards the end of this year. But some of the global strategy strategies actually predicting that the recession can actually hit as early as middle of this year. That depends a lot on the strength of the labor market in the US. For those who actually follow US uh, data, uh, last week they have uh, December private uh, sector payroll uh, ADP. That actually came in stronger than expectation, 235,000 against estimate of 150,000. So the labor market is still strong, which means a recession may not hit anytime soon. But the irony is that if the labor market is strong, that gives the Fed even stronger excuses to keep raising rates. That could result in an even deeper recession. So we just have to follow or monitor the uh, data very closely. In fact, uh, today 9.30, there would be a December CPI number. This is going to be very important. If the number uh, actually comes in stronger than expectation, then you will actually see a major sell-off in the US market. For those who follow US market, you notice that over the last four days, uh, be it Dow Jones or NASDAQ, they've been gaining uh, uh, four, four days in a row uh, on expectation that tonight, the CPI December number will actually come in milder than expectation. But we will just have to see. Uh, 9 30, uh, you know, uh, halfway through our seminar. Okay. Um, having said that, uh, there are at least two silver linings that I can actually tell you. Number one, I'm sure you know about 
the reopening of China uh, two weeks ago. Uh, this is going to be very positive to Malaysia and you know whole world uh, in, in general. Uh, but of course, there are concerns over whether the sudden surge in cases, uh, whether Chinese, the Chinese government can actually handle it. Uh, we were very worried uh, about one or two weeks ago, there were a lot of horrible uh, re reports suggesting that uh, cases in the millions uh, on a daily basis uh, and uh, funeral houses were actually uh, piled up with bodies. Uh, but over the last one week or so, or over the last couple of days, you notice that the news on China COVID infection has actually died down. So we can only assume that uh, they are actually handling the situation. Uh, put it this way, I mean, if you look at the experience in other parts of the world, uh, India or the US or Europe, yes, uh, you, you can't avoid a sudden surge in cases. But uh, after the strong wave, uh, normally it will actually taper down. And again, as a equity investors, we are more inclined to look beyond the uh, peak of the in infection. And uh, hopefully, Chinese economy would actually normalize uh, after the big wave uh, hit them uh, as what is happening right now. Uh, this is very important because you know there is a slowdown in the US as well as Europe. You need China to come back into the interna international market to buy up natural resources, to buy up manufactured goods, even services, uh, you know, that they, they, they need to fill up the gaps uh, left by uh, the US as well as Europe. And for Malaysia, uh, you'll be surprised. Chi China is actually a bigger trading partner to Malaysia as compared to US. China, you are talking about 16%, whereas uh, US only 11%. So, uh, and of course, you know, Malaysia's tourism industry uh, depends uh, a lot on Chinese tourists. And uh, if you look at the stock markets, uh, some of the stock already reacting to that. Uh, for instance, your NHB uh, share price have actually gone up quite a fair bit over the last uh, one, one to two weeks. Moving on to second silver lining. Uh, those who follow US dollar, you notice that the currency actually peaked about two months ago. This is actually a very good news to EM, i.e. emerging markets like Malaysia. Uh, because when your uh, US dollar is too strong, uh, there is less uh, incentive for interna international investors uh, to come to emerging market and take on too much risk uh, because uh, you know, they will actually suffer from uh, currency translation as well. Uh, but now the US dollar has peaked, meaning that the EM currency would not actually depreciate uh, anymore. Uh, chances are they will actually be appreciating. So that's when uh, the, the risk of investing in EM will become a lot less. Uh, so money will actually be going back to EM equities as well as EM uh, bonds. And the other thing is that uh, if you look at the top chart, uh, that basically what happened during 2018, 2019, when the Fed raised rates. Uh, and uh, the bars basically show you the money flowing in out of emerging market. So if you can look at the chart when the Fed was actually raising rates, uh, you see outflows from uh, emerging market equities, meaning that uh, in international investors are actually selling off uh, EM shares. But as and when the rates uh, peaked, uh, you, you, you can see that in the second part of the chart, uh, the money uh, started to come back to emerging market again. Uh, so we are pretty much uh, at this point uh, because uh, just now, uh, you know, I, I spoke about the uh, rate hikes in the US to peak in March at 5%. So we are almost there already. It's already at the tail end of the US rate hike cycle. So for that reason, there is a strong likelihood that the money will start to flow back to emerging market again. And Malaysia, we are in a sweet spot. Uh, why is that? If you look at the table at the bottom, it's basically showing you the rating of all the EM countries in the index. Uh, of course, China is the big brother. Lah. They command more than 30%. Uh, but I want you to focus on Malaysia. Uh, 18 months ago in July 2021, our rating was actually at 1.24. Right? And right now, December 2022, the rating actually increased to 1.52. Uh, even though it's a small change, uh, it is... Uh, uh, 
translate to very big difference in the M index, MSCI is all right. Uh, why Malaysia's rating is actually uh, going up over the last 18 months. Uh, in fact, this is the first time ever in many, many years that we are actually seeing our rating in the index increasing. Reason why uh, in the past our rating was falling is mainly because of uh, our big brother, China, who, who was like taking rating away from everybody else in the index. But uh, towards uh, middle of 2021, um, people are starting to get worried about uh, um, you know, the uh, Chinese government's crackdown on a few sectors, for instance, education, for instance, tech sector. Uh, there, there was also a property debt crisis in China. And also, I think increasingly, people are worried about uh, Xi Jinping's uh, administration become, becoming more and more authoritarian. So foreign fund managers are starting to leave China. Uh, that will actually affect their rating in the index as well. And secondly, globally, uh, one trend we can actually see right now is that uh, money is actually moving away uh, from tech and growth stocks back to best dominated by value stock, you know, like your plantation, like your banks, the more boring uh, brick and butter, you know, brick and mortar kind of businesses. Uh, but this is actually a good thing because, uh, as I mentioned, the money is actually flowing out uh, from tech and uh, growth stocks back to uh, value stock. So we are benefiting. And of course, uh, Russia, uh, when they invaded uh, Ukraine uh, many months ago, the uh, MSCI immediately kicked them out from the index. And prior to them being kicked out from the uh, index, they actually commanded about three, more than 3% weighting in the index. So this uh, weighting uh, had been redistributed amongst the uh, UM, EM countries uh, in the index. And also lastly, uh, as you all know, we have a new prime minister and the expectation is that this new prime minister will be more friendly to foreign capital, be it short term, hot money if you like, or long term. And uh, we wouldn't be surprised one he has settled in, he will start to uh, go on a international crucial to try and entice and attract uh, investor back to Malaysia. I think he realizes that foreign money is very important to our economy as well as stock market. You want your economy, your stock market to be vibrant. You need participation from the foreign investors. I mean, those who uh, those who are investing in uh, stock market during the eighties and nineties. You know, you can actually tell how the foreign flow can actually uh, make the big difference in our stock market. Uh, as a side point, I mean, uh, right now we are doing an online kind of a seminar. I mean, when, when I'm doing a, a physical kind of seminar uh, back in those days, I, I, I love to also tell the audience, um, you know, during the good 80s, 90s, our Malaysia's rating in the index was actually 33.6%. Now we are 1.5. Can you imagine that? Uh, of course, uh, for those, again, who remember what happened during Asian financial crisis in 1998, the moment, the mo moment we implemented capital control, uh, we were a bit like Russia, lah, you know, we were being kicked out altogether from the index. Uh, because uh, if you have capital control in place, uh, your country become uninvestable. Uh, that's when our rating actually fell to zero. Lah. But over time, when the capital control was lifted, uh, that, that's when we started to regain uh, our rating in the index. Unfortunately, by, by that time, uh, China was already coming. So basically, it's taking away all the uh, rating from uh, Malaysia, uh, as well as some of the uh, EM countries like Brazil. Uh, so uh, coming back to uh, uh, the thing I wanted to say, you know, when I was actually conducting all this physical uh, seminar uh, in uh, some of the uh, smaller towns in Malaysia, I love to ask the audience, uh, show of hand, who thinks, who thinks the uh, bull market will actually come back to Malaysia, like in the 80s, in the 90s. Uh, most of the time, I can actually see a few hands, uh, but then I will actually tell them, it, it's just not possible. Why is that? Because those days, our rating is more than 30%. Uh, so foreigners, whether they like Tun M or they don't like Tun Ham, they still need to put money in Malaysia. But this day, our rating is only 1.5. Uh, so uh, if you want, if, if you're hoping that, you know, the kind of bull market in the 80s and 90s can, can actually come back to Malaysia again, uh, unfortunately, it is such impossible uh, without having a very big rating in MSCI EM index. 
uh, a side point also uh, during those days um, you know uh, when Malaysia commanding more than 30 percent rating in the index Mark Morbius, you know the specialist, uh, the potakai in uh, in uh, 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 you know the specialist in, uh, in emerging market. When he came over to Malaysia to do company visit, right, he actually stayed in Malaysia for ten days. You know, he was like seeing so many companies. He even even bought a house in Johor, I believe. Uh, but of course, now his focus is pretty much on uh, India. For those who also follow his uh, you know interview on YouTube or even in uh, CNBC and uh, Bloomberg Network. Okay, uh, coming back to um, second part of our strategy, i.e. amidst all these uh, macro headwinds, uh, potentially U.S. slipping into the recession, I think over the next three to six months, you have to invest very carefully. Uh, you have to look for sectors and companies that can actually give you very strong earnings resilience. So step number one is that uh, you want to avoid exporters because exporters would be hit by the slowdown in the global economy. So you want to focus on companies of which earnings are driven by domestic consumption. And uh, these are the sectors that you should be uh, focusing on. We see strong earnings resilience in banks, in telcos, in automakers, in retailers, as well as construction companies. Uh, starting with banks, uh, we were compiling the uh, earnings for the sector the other day, and it actually quite surprising to me, uh, even for someone who is actually following the market very closely, that the earnings growth turned out turned out to be low twenties, uh, which is very very significant. Uh, but of course, partly that was because of a uh, low base in um twenty twenty two. If you still remember, uh, there was this uh, Chukai Magmo, uh, but. Even if you are to take out with Chukai Makmo, you are still talking about banks growing their earnings in the low teens. Uh, very, very material and significant. Why? Because banks are very big companies and they are very large cap uh, companies. In order to grow 11%, it's definitely not easy. But they can actually do it this year based on our forecast. Uh, why is that? There's still decent loans growth and they also need to make less COVID-related provision. In fact, they may even uh, be starting to write back some of the COVID provision they made during uh, COVID years over the last two years. So bank earnings would actually anchor the uh, the, the uh, BUSAS, uh, the whole uh, 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 corporate Malaysia's earnings uh, in 2023. Uh, the other sector we quite like is telco. Uh, I mean, uh, even though uh, the share price have actually recovered quite a fair bit, I think a lot of telco stock are still trading at very low valuation. Uh, I think uh, three months ago when I was going around uh, talking to some of the institutional investors, uh, at that point, Maxis was trading at uh, 3 ringgit, I think 320. Uh, it is a level that I have not seen um, my whole life, I would say. Uh, but of course, right now, it has actually recovered to 380. I think the reason for the very bad performance of telco stock over the last two years is because uh, investors uh, do not quite like the terms of the rollout of 5G in Malaysia. You, you know that uh, how we're going to roll out 5G is to um, rely on a uh, government SPV called uh, DNB, uh, Digital National Berhad. Uh, we are using a model called Single Wholesale Network, meaning that there's only one government uh, let organization is going to put in the 5G infra and all the telcos will have to list uh, bandwidth from this uh, DNB. So uh, investors are worried that, you know, without competition, whether DNB is going to overcharge the telcos and for that reason, you know, it will actually into telcos margin, so on and so forth. Uh, but right now, uh, you have a new unity government led by DH and if you Go back to what uh, Anwar actually said while he was still an uh, opposition leader back in 2021. He himself doesn't quite like this single wholesale network model because, as you know, left leaning government, i.e., uh, PH, they are more prone to competition. They don't like monopoly. So I think SWN uh, struck them as another monopolistic kind of uh, government uh, company. So they may actually modify uh, their, their terms uh, with regards to the 5G rollout, and that could potentially be resulting in a major re-rating for the telco sector. 
having said that, even without that re-rating, I think Telco earnings will be very strong. Uh, right now, uh, basically, you are, you are doing a lot of things on your smartphone. Without your smartphone, you basically cannot leave. Uh, you know, you are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are working, you know, through the smartphone uh, in your Zoom meeting, you are ordering food, you are doing online shopping, you are, you are streaming your movies. So whether it's inflation, whether it's recession, you will still hang on to your phone. So uh, for the next three months, as I mentioned just now, the global economic outlook is certainly not very clear. So if you own telcos, uh, is is a very good place for you to to hide if you like, uh, and uh, over the longer, o- over the next uh, one or two months, I believe a lot of uh, institutional funds will start to realize that the kind of risk uh, they are facing themselves, and uh, I think they may actually look at the telco uh, stock again to reinvest. Uh, one very good observation is uh, three months ago when I was going around to meet up with all these institutional investors, we actually started to promote telcos to them, but uh, the response was not so great. But this time around, uh, in fact, we are in the middle of our show. Uh, they are definitely a lot more receptive uh, to uh, telco. So uh, I think it's a good time to really, really look at telco stocks like your DG, like your Nexus. Um, yeah, they can actually give you very good uh, upside uh, potential. And uh, downside is uh, pretty much uh, protected, if you like. Uh, auto is one of the, excuse me, the sectors that we quite like. Um, we've been checking this uh, um, motor, uh, they call it uh, TIB, total industri- industry volume, uh, meaning that how, how many cars were actually delivered to the buyers uh, on a monthly basis. And we also check another uh, number, which, which is called uh, the uh, industry outstanding bookings, meaning that you place a booking for your car, but you may have to wait a couple of months before you get your car. That number is actually even more interesting. Why is that? Because in the month of September and October 2022, the number is actually unchanged at 350,000 units, meaning there are still 350,000 bookings waiting for deliveries. I think a couple of months ago, prior to that, uh, you are talking about 400,000. You remember during COVID, there was this uh, SST uh, exemption and people just, uh, you know, were, were buying car like there's no tomorrow. Uh, that's how uh, we got that 400,000 uh, outstanding bookings. But of course, over uh, the uh, months in uh, 2022, the number kind of like falling because uh, the, 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 the vehicles were actually delivered. But then, uh, coming back to what I said just now, in the month of September and October last year, the, the number actually stopped falling. It was actually remained unchanged at 350,000, which means you know, whatever deliveries were fully replenished with new bookings. Uh, so even without the uh, SST exemption, Malaysian are still buying, buying new cars. So this is actually good news which means that the earnings of uh, motor companies or auto companies uh, will be very, very strong uh, over the next you know, 9 to 12 months from, from, from now. I actually can give you a bit more uh, uh, stock picks later on. Uh, we also like retailers. Um, basically, it's consumer, but for consumer sector, our focus is pretty much on retailers rather than uh, food producers or processors, uh, meaning that we like Aeon, we like My News, but we are a bit concerned over FNN, Nestle. Why is that? Because retailers, uh, they are actually benefiting from the so-called revenge uh, shopping by the consumer. Um, however, the food producers like FNN, like Nestle, they are actually having a bit of problem passing on the higher cost of uh, soft commodity to the uh, end users. Uh, one thing is that uh, retailers like Aeon, their main customers are actually M40 groups, uh, M40 groups meaning the middle income group. They still have a bit of a lot of savings. Uh, their household balance sheet is actually quite good, so they can actually continue to spend despite the high inflation. But uh, B40, they are a lot more vulnerable to inflation because this inflation is basically eating into their spending power. Uh, and for that reason, um, you know the the FNN and Nestle of the world that they have not raised prices uh, enough. 
to pass on the full, full uh, increase in soft money for commodity prices to the end user, varying that you know people will actually cut back on the spending. So uh, for that reason, uh, retailers' margins are quite strong, whereas uh, food producers, their margins are being eroded. Um, construction, um, we actually quite bullish uh, on the sector just right before the election, because at that point of time, people were thinking that uh, BN was going to win big and uh, they're going to roll out all these uh, public infrastructure projects. But of course, you know the, what was the outcome of the election. But it doesn't really matter because uh, the unity government led by PH will still be uh, rolling out public projects, but the timing will be a bit delayed because right now, I think the focus is pretty much to uh, you know, review uh, some of these big contracts being awarded by the previous administration. After they've done this, uh, they would actually start rolling out the new uh, public projects, uh, especially MRT3. Uh, I think they would definitely do that. Why is that? Because um, you need all these public projects to, to uh, pump right the economy, to shield the domestic economy from uh, the, the uh, slowdown in the external sector. So uh, uh, maybe towards the... Uh, 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 end of first half, that's when I think you should actually uh, relook at uh, construction companies uh, ahead of uh, co new contracts being awarded by the uh, government. Uh, okay. Um, the uh, outlook presentation wouldn't be complete without talking a bit on politics, but uh, just to give you uh, a uh, uh, broad idea as to what are the uh, investors' concerns? Uh, right now, as you know, uh, we have a unity government uh, with uh, more than two-thirds uh, majority, but they are concerned over what will happen um, after the AMNO election, which is supposed to be uh, held about four or five months from now. If there is a significant change in the balance of power in AMNO, whether the uh, 30 blue dots on your left-hand side may actually leave the unity government. Uh, so that, that is a concern and it's a valid concern. Uh, but we believe or we take comfort uh, um, uh, that PH they now control 82 seats as long as GPS is to stay. 82 plus 23, you get 105. Okay, so which means you only need uh, seven out of the 13 green dots on your right-hand side, uh, these are mainly uh, parties bay uh, in Sabah. You only need seven of those uh, green dots to give you the threshold 112. So uh, for that reason, I think uh, um, if, even without BN, I think the unity government can still uh, survive. Uh, but I think right now, the uh, focus of the market is not so much uh, on the... Uh, uh, stability of the unity government. I think uh, at the market kind of like assume uh, this uh, unity government would actually last. Uh, I think their main uh, concern or the main thing they want to uh, know is what to expect in February 24th when uh, Anwar Ibrahim is going to announce the revised budget. So uh, right now, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the market is trying to put aside the uh, political risk uh, and they basically work on the basis that this uh, unity government uh, would, would actually last. Uh, of course, when we talk to uh, our investors, some are a bit concerned over some of the uh, new policies uh, being rolled out by the uh, new unity government. Uh, as you know, as you would have followed, they cut the draw days for uh, NFOs. Uh, some people are not very happy. And then uh, uh, they actually highlighted that the rice import in Malaysia is dominated by one party. And they're asking that party to do something about it. And then uh, midnight, 1st January, you remember there's no uh, firework display by Petronas. Uh, to me, it's pretty much symbolic. But uh, that is uh, also, uh, they, they want to send out a message that uh, we want to be uh, prudent with our, with our financial. And uh, if you remember also in December, uh, the new communication and digital minister, Fami, actually came out to ask Telco to cut prices again. Uh, if you recall, in uh, 2018, uh, Gobin Singh asked uh, 
uh, telco to cut their rates by half. And uh, that's when uh, TM, if you remember, fell to uh, two ringgit. Uh, so market was a bit worried about uh, this uh, more left-leaning government to actually roll out some of the uh, policies, which are too consumer uh, as compared to pro-business. But uh, the saving grace is that uh, then we, we actually knew that uh, in the end, what FAMI actually announced was uh, Telco, they actually came out with a uh, special package for the B40 group where, uh, you know, you, you spend 30 ringgits, you get six months of uh, data subscription. So, uh, yeah, no big deal. Lah. So, which means that uh, uh, the, the knee-jerk reaction when he announced this in uh, December, if you remember that day, CI actually dropped quite significantly because all the Telco stock went down. Uh, in the end, it turned out to be a non-event. But then, as uh, investors, you 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 still, you still have to be very uh, have to be mentally prepared. Uh, let's say uh, for any potential uh, more left-leaning kind of policy being implemented. But uh, before that, I think uh, we take comfort that uh, this is not a pure left-leaning government. This is a unity government where you also have partners from the right-hand side, i.e. Uh, BN and uh, as well as GPS is pretty much uh, left, uh, sorry, like right-leaning kind of uh, parties. So you have check and balance within the uni unity government. But assuming, uh, you know, some of these left-leaning policy are to be rolled out, uh, then uh, the market will get um, a bit uh, worried. Uh, say, for instance, if we are opening up our economy for foreign competition a little bit too fast, uh, then you may have a bit of sound down uh, on some of the listed uh, sectors uh, on Busan, Malaysia. And uh, pro-consumer, if they are pro-consumer uh, policy being rolled out, like for instance, uh, the government asking uh, telco to cut prices, the com consumer would actually benefit, but the corporate would actually be suffering in terms of profitability. La. That's what you saw in 2018 uh, back then when, uh, like I said, TM share price actually went down to two ringgit. And I think... Um, the current government is more uh, prone towards uh, smaller GLCs because, you know, our, our economy is very dominantly uh, controlled by uh, GLCs. Uh, it's not to say that is a bad thing, but uh, just that uh, GLCs always were, are always being perceived to be uh, monopolistic in their uh, business model. So that actually uh, killing off competition, which is not so good for uh, consumers, as well as, uh, you know, bringing up our sectors and company to the next level. Uh, I mean, if you are so protected in your domestic market, uh, it is, you know, it can be jago kampong, but if you are not so used to competition, you can never be a uh, global champion. Now. So that's why we think uh, uh, left-leaning government, they kind of like know, knows this. Uh, maybe over time, they want to reduce the uh, GLC's role in the uh, economy. Uh, fiscal prudence, I actually mentioned that um, if we are to cut back on spending, the government is to cut back on spending, it's going to affect uh, sectors which are relying on uh, government contracts. Uh, I think construction is one of them. Uh, fiscal prudence uh, by itself is actually not a bad thing, uh, but uh, it will actually ensure long-term uh, financial sustainability. Uh, but if they do it too abruptly, it's uh, not going to be too good for the market as well. And uh, uh, and and uh, the other thing is that uh, left-leaning government is more prone towards free market economy model uh, that do not quite like too many subsidies because that would actually distort the allocation of resources within the economy. Uh, they're already talking about more targeted subsidies, especially for petrol. Uh, but again, uh, I think they also realize that right now the inflation is still uh, kind of high. Uh, so they are not going to you know, pull this back uh, abruptly and affecting uh, 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 consumers' uh, spending. Uh, lastly, GST. Uh, GST, uh, strictly speaking, has nothing to do with your political in inclination, whether you are left-leaning or right-leaning, nothing. Uh, but we put it down here mainly because um, you know, assuming um, PH is more left-leaning, and then uh, if you remember, twenty back back then in twenty eighteen, the uh, abolishing GST was one of their election promises. 
So uh, I think uh, they also realized that uh, it's very important to introduce some form of consumption tax in the economy and to help to broaden the tax revenue base of the country. I think they fully understand that, uh, but uh, they may not actually introduce it immediately. Uh, uh, because after all, in 2018, they were against this uh, GST. I think uh, give it 12 months uh, after that, maybe they will do something, uh, they will introduce something like GST, uh, they can call it VAT or whatever acronym they like. Uh, but, you know, the end result is that uh, we need to broaden our consumption taxes. Uh, um, for those who uh, follow news also, it's quite interesting. I think last week, uh, FMM uh, came out to... Uh, proposed to the government to reintroduce GSD at 4%. Okay, federal, uh, F FMM, Fed Federation of uh, Manufacturer of Malaysia. Uh, of course, uh, what they are uh, arguing is that, yes, you can actually bring, bring back GSD, but on the other hand, maybe you want to reduce your corporate tax rates as well as your personal tax rates. Okay, coming back to uh, talk about sectors again. Uh, I think I highlighted uh, most of the sectors we like uh, just now, uh, just to add on to the list. Uh, we also like building material. Um, there are two key stocks there, uh, P-Metal, uh, which I believe you are very familiar with. Valuation is definitely not cheap in terms of PE, but we think P-Metal is a very good ESG play. And uh, they are also a China's reopening play, uh, given the fact that aluminum, aluminum prices have actually gone up uh, a bit. In fact, all commodity prices have actually gone up uh, after the reopening. So this will actually uh, be translating to better profits for p -Metal. We also like uh, another company called OM Material, uh, which are basically uh, doing or making uh, barrel silicon as well as manganese uh, in uh, Samalaju in Sarawak. They are going to be benefiting for, from very firm uh, ferrosilicon and manganese prices, mainly because the uh, supply of this material, uh, which are actually used in steel making, is very tight in the uh, global market right now, uh, partly because of the war and partly because of the supply chain uh, disruptions. Okay, going down the list, uh, gaming, uh, we are positive on casino operators. Um, I think they did uh, disappoint uh, in terms of earnings um, over the last two quarters. I think market expectations were kind of like unrealistic uh, because at that point in time, the reopening was only partial. But I think in coming quarters, they're definitely going to show uh, much stronger numbers. So we do have a uh, buy for Genting as well as Genting Malaysia. Uh, as you know, uh, as the internal, international borders are uh, reopened, uh, you will actually uh, be seeing more Chinese tourists coming back to uh, the uh, casino as well. Uh, or in guess we are positive. We are looking at uh, high prices of uh, 80 US dollar per barrel. At 80 US dollar per barrel uh, is a level of which oil majors are more than happy to expand, to spend on uh, KPEX. Uh, when they start spending on KPEX, including Petronas, uh, then uh, it will actually result in a lot of uh, jobs uh, for our service provider in the market. Uh, some of the names I think you are very familiar with, uh, Amada, Dayang, uh, Valesto, as well as Usma, which I will talk a bit more later on. Uh, private healthcare, we like uh, IHH as well as KPJ. Uh, I mean, if you happen to be in one of the private hospitals uh, in town during the weekend, you can actually see how heavy is the traffic because a lot of people basically postpone their elective surgeries, meaning the, the less urgent ones uh, during the COVID uh, period. Now they're coming back uh, to, to do these uh, elective surgeries. And also, uh, I mean, if you happen to be, uh, you know, uh, getting some services from private hospital, you know that the raised prices, like, you know, there's no tomorrow, but, but and yet, you know, you're happily paying, settling the bill, mainly because uh, medical services, they have a uh, very strong pricing power. They can effectively pass on all the higher costs to the end user. Not like uh, I mentioned just now, you know, food producers because their target customers are actually B forty. So uh, you know, they have to pa partially absorb all these higher costs. Okay, utilities is basically Tenaga. 
I think uh, for those who really follow Tanaga, you notice that uh, uh, there's a certain mechanism uh, that would actually pass on the higher fuel costs back to the government. Uh, ICPT is called. Um, problem is uh, government was kind of like uh, very tight in cash flow. So that amount was actually uh, snowballing, uh, especially over uh, 2022. Uh, so people are getting a bit concerned. Uh, they call it actually under under recovery of fuel costs. So that amount actually ballooned to a very large number. Market got worried. Uh, that's why Tenaga got sold down, especially due, during the first half of 2022. But thereafter, uh, government started to, you know, to, to pay up uh, bit by bit. So that's when uh, Tenaga share price started to recover. I think our view is very simple. Uh, the government is going to honour going to settle the full amount of whatever they owe the Naga, no doubt about it. Um, and also the other thing is that uh, you have you can actually tie back uh, what I, I, I said just now uh, with regards to e money flowing back to emerging markets, uh, including Malaysia. Um, the Naga commands a very heavy weighting in FBM30. I think uh, it used to be uh, low teens, uh, now probably in the high single digit. So, um, yeah, when, when all this foreign money uh, starts to come back to Malaysia, whether you, they like Tenaga or not, they will have to buy because uh, Tenaga is a very heavily weighted uh, kind of index stock. Okay, let me see. Uh, okay, we uh, already, uh, already talked about 45 minutes, so I try to keep to the timing. Okay, the sectors which we are not too gumbo at this point is uh, aviation. Uh, yes, uh, MHB definitely going to be uh, benefiting from Chinese tourists. But uh, if you remember end of last year, um, even during uh, the uh, PN government, uh, a de decision has been made, i.e. not to raise airport taxes. So uh, this is actually not too good for MHB, given the fact that your operating cost is actually going up. Um, the other thing is A-Asia. Uh, we are still concerned over A-Asia's Spanish ship. Now it's called Capital Air, as you know. Uh, but surely share price actually moved up uh, quite significantly from 60 cents to 70 cents over the last one month or so because of uh, you know China reopening play. Uh, but I think uh, if you want to buy Capital Air, uh, you have to be uh, fully aware that there are still a PN company and then PN70 company and then, uh, you know, uh, they may just need to raise more funds uh, in order to pack up their balance sheet. Uh, media companies like uh, Media Chinese, uh, Media Prima, um, even Astro, they are not so exciting right now because they are struggling to transform uh, from traditional to digital kind of uh, uh, platform. Uh, plantation, uh, we actually quite like the sector, but Unfortunately, share prices are not going anywhere because there's not so much uh, re-rating catalyst uh, over the immediate term. The uh, CPU prices, we are actually looking at 3,800 for 2023, uh, which is lower than uh, 4,005 we got in 2022. But at the same time, at, uh, at, at 3,800 3, actually is quite profitable uh, for plantation business. But unfortunately, at the same time, your production cost is also going up, especially fertilizers. Uh, so net net, I think plantation is still a very cash generative kind of business. Uh, the only thing is that uh, with uh, CPU prices, uh, you know, uh, significantly lower than what uh, you saw uh, the, the peak uh, during 2022, um, investors are just not, uh, uh, getting too excited over plantation at this point in time. Plastic and packaging, these are mostly uh, the plastic uh, maker like Tongguan, SLP. Um, we are not too uh, positive at this point, uh, mainly because these guys, 80% of their product are actually exported uh, to Europe uh, as well as Japan. Uh, they are going to be uh, suffering uh, because of the slowdown in the global economy. Uh, property, I think you notice that one of our competitors actually upgraded the sector recently, which we don't think, uh, we, we think is a bit premature uh, for 
for a very strong, uh, for, for a very simple reason, i.e. your mortgage rate is actually going up. Uh, and at the same time, your construction cost is also going up. So that is going to hurt your affordability, meaning that, you know, uh, homes can become a lot less affordable to some of the uh, lower income group. Uh, so definitely not the time to uh, upgrade the sector. Uh, yes, I understand that uh, the sector has been uh, in a do doldrum for the longest time. Uh, for those who follow the sector, you remember it peaked during 2014. Uh, that's when also uh, the oil and gas sector peaked. Thereafter, both the sector actually crashed. But uh, oil and gas already came back, but uh, you know, property is lagging. I think uh, I, I don't think we have seen the light at the end of the tunnel as yet for property sector. Uh, REITs actually give you a stable uh, yield, uh, 5%, 6%. But, but again, because if you can get uh, about 4% from FD this day, uh, REITs become uh, less attractive because uh, REITs is not risk-free, you know. Uh, things can go wrong, uh, shopping mall occupancy can drop for whatever reason. So for that additional one, two percentage point you are getting from REITs, it, it's just not worthwhile, I think, uh, at this uh, moment. Seaport and logistic, uh, uh, as you know, because of the slowdown in Europe as well as uh, US, global trade is actually slowing. So this is not too positive for ports uh, as well as uh, logistic companies. Uh, technology, EMS, uh, uh, it is a hot sector back in 2022 before the uh, sharp correction in NASDAQ. Uh, share prices have come down quite significantly. So uh, we did get questions from investors whether it's a good time to position ourselves for tech stock again. We think maybe it's a bit too early, mainly because right now, uh, the chip sector is still undergoing uh, inventory adjustment, uh, meaning that uh, the end users, uh, they are carrying quite a fair bit of stock and they have no intention to actually uh, order for new stocks. At the same time, the, the product are, uh, uh, demand for their product are slowing. So uh, you have actually inventory built up all over the place. Uh, you would have to take a while before uh, this thing can actually go away. Uh, but we do have uh, certain names, uh, not quite in the chip sector that we like, but it's in the technology sector, uh, KGB, uh, as well as LGMS, which I may talk a bit more uh, later on. Uh, hopefully, if I can actually uh, keep to my timeline. Um, tobacco breweries, uh, pretty much like uh, REITs. Um, again, because of, uh, you know, 4% you can actually get from your FD, uh, a tobacco brewery, maybe I give you six seven percent. Uh, but for that six seven, for that additional two three percent, uh, given the kind of uh, risk, uh, you know, uh, regulatory risk. Uh, suddenly, government said, uh, you know, kids are not allowed to, uh, even consume uh, cigarettes uh, going forward. Those kind of thing, uh, it will actually hurt your uh, share price. So it's uh, risk that not uh, before taking. Uh, gloves, uh, the uh. Major outperformer during COVID uh, days. Uh, unfortunately, uh, even, even after share prices come down by 90%, uh, there's still no investment case uh, for this uh, sector. I think uh, we, we did get question as to, you know, why you want to call a sell on a stock that has gone down by 92%, right? It doesn't make sense. But the thing is that uh, even at the current level, um, the valuation is... Not attractive. Uh, they are not profitable. Uh, that's number one. So there's no PE to talk about. Then next, you look at their asset value, right? Book value. Okay. I think uh, two out of the four big uh, cross stocks are still trading at a premium to their book value. Uh, then you say, why not? Uh, but then you have to look behind what are the assets? Uh, what is the book value? Two things. Number one, they have machine. Number two, uh, they actually accumulated quite a fair bit of cash uh, during good times. And you know their plant, their machine, uh, they are basically running at 30% utilization at, the, at this point in time. So when your asset is only 30% utilized, unfortunately, 
you have to take a discount. Then you, you say, oh, what about cash? You know, cash is cash. Uh, you cannot take a discount on cash. But the rea reality is that uh, these companies are actually making losses. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's not only like uh, p and losses. It could even be cash losses, meaning that they're also burning their cash because the prices are so bad. Uh, okay, uh, just, just to give you uh, an idea, uh, to produce 1,000 pieces of glove, your cost is US dollar 20 to 22. Okay, 20 to 22. And you know what kind of prices they're selling right now is US $20 per 1,000 pieces. And uh, what kind of prices the Chinese producers are selling, they are selling at 15, one five US dollar per 1,000 pieces. So uh, that's why uh, during the surge in COVID cases in China, nobody actually got orders from China because they themselves are producing so many gloves and they're selling at 15 US dollar per 1,000 pieces, whereas we are selling at 20, right? Okay, coming back to our topics, uh, our overall topics, uh, we put a lot of banks there, uh, Maybank, um, CIMB, as well as ABMB is basically Alliance Bank. Um, we like these three banks. For Telco, we like DG uh, because they are the market leader right now after the merger with Southcom. Uh, plantation, a sector we like, uh, but we don't want too much exposure at this point of time. But we still want to own KLK, which is the uh, you know big brother of uh, plantation stock. Um, Gamuda uh, would be our preferred construction company. Why is that? While waiting for the MRT3 project to get off the ground, um, they are already securing quite a number of overseas jobs, especially from Australia. So, uh, good sign. Uh, all right, guess we have a funky pick here, Amada, uh, for uh, institutional investors, uh, especially they lost so much money that they're basically, uh, you know, happy to forget about this stock. And, uh, but we think, we think uh, the company has turned around. Uh, previously, they had a bit of issue with their balance sheet, uh, but they already paid down quite a fair bit of their borrowings. So you can actually say that they have managed to restore their financial health. And what's so interesting is that the market has not actually priced in the possibility of them getting new contracts. Whereas for other big boys, like for instance, Yinsen, uh, it is almost uh, you know, an uh, open secret that they are going to get contracts. So the market e effectively has actually priced in uh, these so-called so surprises. But for Amada, it's not the case uh, because Insti clients, they are not actually following this stock very closely. And some of them could have written off the stock altogether. But then, uh, like what I said just now, they have managed to restore their financial health. And the market for oil and gas service out there is very tight. Uh, everybody got their orders already. Uh, this is one of the few guys who still has capacity. So when uh, eventually they get a major contract, uh, that's when your share price will actually uh, you know, re rate up significantly. Um, for auto stock, we like the auto mini because uh, we like their uh, Mazda franchise. Uh, Mazda is a mid-market uh, kind of vehicle. Uh, they are actually uh, more expensive than their competitors. Uh, they are always being perceived in Malaysia as a premium uh, mid-market uh, kind of uh, vehicle so that uh, P Auto can actually make much better margins as compared to its uh, competitors. For retailers, we like Aeon and MyNews. Um, I mean, you can actually see the uh, footfall, the traffic uh, improving uh, after the economy actually reopened. And uh, the coming year, they are going to benefit from the full year impact of the economy reopening. Uh, so uh, share price can actually really perform. Uh, I think those who bought uh, my news, uh, you realize that uh, share price almost doubled already. Uh, at the low, it was at 41 cents. Uh, that's when uh, they deliver a very strong, I remember it's actually the quarter results. Uh, that's when we actually upgraded. So share has actually performed very, very nicely. Um, I'm not quite sure any of you actually uh, follow Sharia, but uh, 
for our Sharia topics that we actually uh, recommend to our institutional investors. Uh, we basically took out the banks and replaced it with a lot of telco names like um, Maxis, TM, as well as uh, OCK. OCK is a telco tower uh, operators. Um, we also like uh, CTOS uh, because after listing, ShareBuyers has uh, come down quite a fair bit already. So uh, it, it has become uh, less expensive. Uh, okay, I think I still have about 15 minutes to uh, in my presentation. Maybe I just go to go through very quickly uh, some of the uh, names we like uh, within the sectors. Okay, for auto, we like uh, MBM, MBMR, uh, mainly because they are the uh, proxy to Grodua. Uh, the, uh, I believe some of the new models, the waiting period right now is actually more than one year. So you are talking about very good earnings visibility. I think both the uh, stock MBMR and B Auto, they also pay very decent dividend of more than 6%. So uh, these are two auto stocks you want to take a look. Um, banks, I think I pretty much done there. Uh, our, our picks are May Bank, uh, mainly because you are getting your 9% dividend yield. I know Sherpa is not really moving that much. Uh, but I think 9% is a very decent uh, kind of uh, return for, you know, uh, this kind of safe stock that you can actually, uh, you know, buy it and sleep at night. Uh. CIMB, we like it uh, because um, uh, uh, they, it is one of the uh, names that the foreign fund would actually uh, love to own when they come back to the market, uh, apart from what is being shown uh, there. Uh, so there is a, it, it's a bit like a high beta banking stock. Like right? uh, Alliance actually gone up quite a fair bit, uh, but the value is still there. Uh, mainly because, uh, you know, if for those who are familiar with uh, financial ratio, the ROE return on equity is actually 11%. Uh, dividend yield is 6%. It's, it's as good as uh, some of the bigger names in town. So that's why we still like it. Uh, we talk about this one, P-Metal and uh, OM Material. A uh, construction, we talk about Bermuda. A consumer, yeah, I talked about that already. Um, main sector, uh, we like Genting. Uh, basically, it's the uh, reopening play. Uh, Spot Total is pretty much for your 8% new. Um, all right, I guess uh, for Big Cap, we actually recommend PCAM. Um, the uh, PE valuation has become quite cheap, uh, mainly because you see the, the end product is actually uh, uh, chemicals, petrochemicals, and the prices have actually come off uh, in line with uh, oil prices. But at the current level, they are still highly profitable, a bit like the plantation situation where you know people expect prices to come off the peak and then they don't show a lot of interest. But in terms of valuation, uh, it's actually quite decent. Right now, it's actually trading at 10 times. Uh, well, prior to pandemic, it was actually trading at 15 times. So value is definitely there. So you can actually look at uh, PCAM. Amada is our small cap pick. Uh, healthcare, we like IHH uh, because of uh, private hospital. We also like Cotra. Uh, this is an interesting uh, pharmaceutical company. Um, their biggest brand is actually Abaddon. Uh, I mean, even personally, I thought Abaddon was a foreign brand, uh, but only recently I found it's actually a local brand. They invested quite a lot in this brand during the initial years. Uh, now they are actually uh, re recouping their, their investment in the sense that people are already very familiar with the brand and they're willing to pay a premium to their product. So that's why their earnings are actually coming through. Uh, MGRC, um, this one is quite interesting. They're actually doing uh, DNA sequencing uh, previously, but right now they're actually expanded into what they call immunotherapy is uh, a new therapy for cancer patient. Uh, I think it was a uh, very expensive uh, treatment uh, for those who, for, for the package coming from Europe. But uh, MGRC managed to get a similar thing uh, from China, uh, which is equally effective, but the price is just a fraction of uh, what the European are charging. That's why. Uh, this, this business segment is actually growing uh, very rapidly. In fact, they have exclusive right to uh, distribute that uh, Chinese-based uh, immunotherapy product uh, in the regional markets as well. Uh, so this is one of the stocks you want to watch. 
Foucault, uh, we talk about that. Uh, utilities, Kanaga, we talk about that as well. Uh, aviation, uh, we don't like uh, both uh, airport as well as capital air. Um, media, if you want to buy something, uh, maybe uh, Media Prima is our pick uh, because um, uh, they do have a certain digital business uh, within their portfolio. Plantation pick is KLK, as I mentioned. Uh, and for plastic and packaging, uh, I think uh, if you want to buy one, uh, that would be Tongwan. Uh, for property stocks, uh, we go for the more defensive ones, uh, which are uh, to some extent they have uh, also some um, uh, overseas exposure, of which are doing quite well, uh, especially for IOI uh, properties. Um, Ecover, uh, I think, a very strong brand, and uh, they still manage to actually uh, record very good sales despite uh, the very soft uh, market condition right now. REITs, uh, yeah, if you want to buy one, uh, that will be Pavilion REITs, uh, mainly because of the uh, uh, very strategic, strategic uh, uh, asset, i.e. your Pavilion shopping mall. And uh, they will actually be benefiting from the return of the uh, international tourists. C-Port, uh, we like B-Port because B-Port uh, is, is uh, not so much subject to the uh, uh, global trade slowdown. Uh, they are specialists in handling the uh, 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 LNG from uh, MLNG in uh, Sabah. Uh, Shif is a domestic logistic company, uh, warehousing uh, as well as uh, uh, logistic uh, integrated logistic services uh, within uh, Malaysia. They are actually benefiting from the booming, uh, as you know, e-commerce uh, market in Malaysia. Technology, uh, okay, this one maybe I'll spend a bit more time. Uh, KGB, basically a contractor to um, uh, to uh, uh, fabrication, uh, chip fabrication plants. Uh, a lot of uh, chip makers are actually expanding their plants right now, even though, you know, uh, as I mentioned just now, the sector is undergoing an inventory adjustment. Uh, they are basically uh, investing for the future. And uh, KGB uh, is uh, one of the uh, contractors uh, for all this uh, wafer plant expansion. Uh, they are basically announcing new contracts every few weeks. So uh, they're actually doing okay. Uh, the only thing is that, uh, the, the only complaints uh, from some of our institutional investors is that uh, the share price uh, did not quite come down that much now, despite the uh, correction in tech sector. So, you know, when share prices come down, you know what to do like, for KGB. LGMS, uh, this is an ACE listed company. Um, they are actually specialists in uh, cyber security. Uh, basically, their business model is uh, they provide hacking service. Okay, you might, might, could be like scratching your head. Uh, why people um, hire these people to hack their system? Uh, actually, the whole idea is to hire them to hack and see how uh, how secure is your uh, system. And uh, uh, over time, I think uh, this has become one of the uh, SOP for most uh, companies with uh, you know digital presence. Uh, so their business is actually expanding uh, very nicely. So this is uh, these are the two tech stocks uh, which are not uh, chip related that you can actually look at it. Uh, uh, no, uh, no recommendation at all. All right. Uh, okay. I think um about that. Uh, just uh, five minutes short. Uh, maybe I open the floor for a uh, question. Thank you so much, uh, Joshua, for sharing with us where are the investment opportunities for the year 2023 and what are the sectors that have earnings resilience. So if you have any questions, ask the head of research of uh, Kananga, please write your questions in the Q&A box so we can address them accordingly. We have about 20 minutes for question and answer. All right, the first question is asked by GLTO. So uh, Mr. Joshua, uh, so the question here is, so far, the Bursa still see continuous foreign outflow. 
So why mm -hmm. is that so? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, last year was actually not so bad. Uh, we were just talking uh, during uh, over lunch uh, this afternoon. Uh, for those who track the uh, foreign inflow and outflow from Malaysia, uh, last year we peaked at about 8 billion, but we closed the year at only about 4 billion. Um, that has uh, a lot to do with uh, expectation uh, on uh, ringgit direction uh, during early part of the year. So initially, uh, uh, the, the market did not quite expect uh, US to raise rate that aggressively. Uh, so as and when, uh, you know, the Fed started to raise 75 basis points a few times, uh, you know, the EN currency has dropped. Uh, that's when uh, foreign money, uh, you know, they decided to take the money and, you know, and, 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 and left. Uh, but, but again, uh, not too bad because considering the fact that uh, I think in recent year, we, we, we saw more than like 10 billion outflow uh, during uh, a single year. But last year is up uh, 4 billion. And going forward, uh, I think if you ask me the direction of uh, foreign funds, uh, like I explained to you uh, just now, the chances of them coming back is actually quite strong. Uh, I'm, I'm actually tracking uh, money flowing out of, uh, or flowing it out and in of uh, EM on a weekly basis, there are some very, very good numbers that I actually keep track of. Uh, you can actually sense that money is uh, starting to go back to emerging market for the reason I highlighted to you just now. And uh, of course, uh, right now, uh, with uh, the even though US uh, have not quite uh, hit the peak rate as yet, but US dollar is already started to uh, uh, weaken. So, uh, I think that the flow out of EM from Malaysia would definitely slow down. Uh, but of course, in the final week, I think there was a massive outflow. That one can't be helped because uh, it's uh, part and parcel of the uh, year and rebalancing. But looking at new year, uh, I, I do believe that uh, money will start to come back to Malaysia and EM as a whole. And hopefully our new prime minister will do something about it to, attract, to bring back uh, foreign investors. Uh, actually, uh, the other point and I forgot to mention just now, for those who keep track of the um, market volume, uh, our market is dominated by retail investors and uh, institutional investors. And, you know, you see the foreign participation is so low, it's like 10%, 15%, not even 20%. Uh, this is not so healthy uh, for a open economy like Malaysia. Hopefully things will change uh, with a new administration. All right, thank you so much, uh, Joshua, for your clarification. I've seen a couple of questions uh, on public bank. Mm. So uh, could you give us your view on this uh, bank since that banking sector is one that uh, you are overweight on? Okay, public bank uh, in terms of valuation is uh, definitely uh, kind of like fully valued. Uh, but of course, uh, people, the, the reason why uh, the stock is fully valued is because people like their, its stability. Uh, it pays dividend, but not so generous as compared to Maybank. Uh, there are concern over after the passing of the founder whether there will be uh, major changes in the shareholding of the bank. Uh, but we are not too concerned uh, because you know there's a bank Nagara rule that uh, no one single individual can hold more than 10% stake in a bank. Um, the management of the bank will be intact. Uh, I think uh, the founder. Uh, I believe had not been very well in recent years as well. Uh, he, he had actually left the running day-to-day -day running of the bank to his uh, uh, you know, successors uh, for the longest time. Uh, they know what to do, not to worry. Earnings are actually quite strong. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this stock is kind of like low beta. Uh, you can buy the stock uh, for dividend and maybe uh, when stock market is a lot better, it may go up, you know, 10 cents, 20 cents. Uh, when stock market is a little bit less, uh, you know, interesting, then it will drop 10 to 20%. So uh, it is a good stock that uh, would help to anchor your portfolio. So if, if you have a portfolio of stocks, uh, yes, you can actually buy some public bank. At the same time, you want to buy some higher beta stock as well to give you that stability. I think. The same formula actually works for uh, prime managers as well. That's why they do own uh, public banks, even though it's not so uh, exciting. 
All right. Thank you so much for your sharing. The next question is by Lim. So between Gunting Berhad and Gunting Malaysia, uh, which company offers a better investment merit? Okay. De depending very much on your risk appetite, lah, I think uh, the argument is that uh, if you want to have a more diversified uh, group, uh, you know, with plantation, with gaming, uh, with other businesses, uh, then you would actually go for Gunting Berhad. Lah. If your focus is pretty much on the gaming side of the business, uh, surely you want to buy uh, in Malaysia. But at this point, I think both are going to be doing well. But but uh, what a caution is that, uh, you know, there's this uh, ESG thing, uh, environmental governance, um, um, social, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, funds, uh, international funds, would no longer touch uh, gaming stocks, uh, no longer touch uh, defense stocks, uh, no longer touch brewery and uh, cigarettes. Uh, so over time, uh, you will actually be seeing uh, derating of the stock because less and less people are chasing this stock. Uh, I think um, if you ask my opinion, uh, the upside of all these uh, non-ESG stock will be kept because uh, a lot of big funds, they own this stock uh, for years. And now, because they need to comply with the uh, ESG standard, they are actually slowly dis disposing of their stake. If you ask me uh, what will be the end game for all these uh, gaming company, uh, maybe eventually they will be taken private. Because uh, given the, uh, the trend towards ESG, there is less and less appetite for uh, this kind of stock. Even these days, when foreign investors come in, they're no longer looking at uh, gaming stock, you know. Last time, uh, these are one, one of those uh, most more popular, popular stock uh, they, 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 they like to invest, uh, you know, and, and then they don't, they don't say, they don't pronounce it at Genting. Uh. They say Genting, Genting, I want to buy Genting. Uh, so you know, what, what is that? Uh? Right, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing this. Um, let's go back to banking. There's one question to ask, what about MBank? Which is not in your list. Do you have any view on this? Uh, bank, bank, we, we do have a buy as well. We do have a buy, but it's not our topics. I think okay. the stock is still trading at a uh, discount to book value. Uh, mm -hmm. As you know, the shipper has done very well uh, last year. I think uh, a few small cap names, your Affin, uh, M Bank, Alliance, actually done very well. Uh, we, we, we do believe uh, there's still upside to uh, some of these uh, small cap stocks because uh, they're trading at a discount to book value. And uh, there could potentially be M&A anger to uh, M-Bank. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if the uh, consolidation of banking sec sector is to, is to eventually uh, happen. Uh, I think previously, some of the theories suggest that because you know, uh, we, we want to wait for the political situation to stabilize before we uh, you know, embark on all these major uh, banking sector consolidation. I'm not quite sure they are even relevant, but these are the theories out there. Mm, all right. Would you be able to give some insights into Dutch Lady Malaysia? So that's the question by Prem. All right. Dutch Lady, uh, okay. Our key concern uh, is still uh, their ability to pass on higher, uh, uh, you know, milk solids, uh, weeds, cost to the end consumer. Having said that, having said that, uh, things have actually changed uh, because all these uh, soft commodity prices have actually come back down uh, from that very crazy levels. So we do expect uh, the margins to recover uh, over the next one or two quarters. I believe we also have a buy for Dutch Lady. Uh, but, but, but again, uh, right now we just uh, worry what if uh, you know, commodity prices start to run again because of uh, China reopening. Uh, so, uh, you know, they would have to be suffering margin compression again. So for, for proxy to consumer sector, I think a safer bet would be uh, retailers, uh, like, like we mentioned, Aeon, my news, uh, instead of all these food producers where they cannot actually pass on higher costs. I think for Aeon, they have no issue uh, to raise prices. Uh, people will still buy because people have not actually replenished their wardrobe over the last two years. Mm, all right. So, uh, Joshua, you are overweight for the telco sector. So, the next question is about Timecom. 
Do you uh, do you cover this stock? Uh, I this company? do not cover. Uh, I think not many houses actually cover the stock mainly because the disclosure is not as great as compared to the other telcos. Uh, but I generally this is a stock. Uh, institutional investors are very bullish on, so it's a buy to me. Mm, all right. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. So let's uh go on to uh, questions that are more uh macro. Uh, so we have a couple of questions also on the uh, macro economy. Mm -hmm. Uh, in short. Are you bullish about the local market until the American market hits the recession? So that's the question. So what, is, what should be the retail investor strategy? Should we hold on to the uh, local companies uh, even throughout the recession if it happens? Right. Okay. First, first thing first, uh, like what I recommended uh, in my presentation, uh, you want to hang on to companies and sector with strong earnings resilience. But if you are talking about the better timing to enter the market. My, my gut feeling is like this. Uh, for those who follow Hong Kong market, you realize that it hits a uh, bottom at uh, below 15,000 uh, just recently and rebounded so strongly to 20, back to 20 again within a very short period of time. Uh, this is something they call capitulation, uh, meaning that everybody gave up, throw in tower, cut losses. Uh, that's when Hang Seng actually hit below 15,000. So after that, you know, rumors started to come out about China reopening. Then the market rebounded. So I think for Hang Seng, they have actually seen the bottom. Unfortunately, for US market, Dow Jones, uh, NASDAQ, for instance, or even, even Busan Malaysia, my gut feeling is that this market have not quite seen the, what I call, capitulation. So, uh, well, it can happen if you have uh, very bad numbers coming out from US. Uh, like I mentioned uh, later, oh, 9.30, I'm not quite sure the number came out already. Uh, if the number is actually not so great, uh, then uh, there, there could be some off. Uh, yeah, I mean, people are tracking this number on a monthly basis. So uh, or, or for whatever reason, uh, there is a big sell off. Um, you know, people cut losses in a massive way. Uh, basically, you... Uh, you know, you, you win out all the weak holders, uh, that's when the market will actually come back stronger. So, uh, although we do have a N2023 target of 1640, uh, I, I, I would imagine it's not going to be straight line kind of a, a rise to 1640. You may actually see lower before it starts to recover. So, uh, I think if you ask me, I would still love to see uh, some sort of... Uh, final sell off uh, before the market can actually come back stronger. But again, as um, equity investors, you can't be holding uh, zero position, right? Uh, you still want to own something. Uh, uh, right now, our recommendation is to go for more defensive uh, kind of uh, sectors. But as and when uh, the cycle turns, uh, let's say uh, inflation in US is under control and the Fed is starting to talk about cutting rates, uh, maybe that's when you want to jump back to uh, growth stock, you know, your tech and uh, your, 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 your growth stock that actually give you uh, much more upside. But right now, over the next three, six months especially, I think I would rather stick with uh, the most defensive sector like uh, you know, the ones I recommended to you. Well, um, doesn't cutting rate means that the recession is about to hit? That's when they are prepared to cut rates? Uh, okay, this time around is a bit different. Uh, uh, it, it's something that, uh, well, I haven't seen before as well. Uh, you, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because the uh, Fed, the ECB are actually raising rates uh, while the economy is actually slowing uh, because you have inflation problem. So uh, I think the rate cuts will happen when, you know, they see that inflation is pretty much under control. Because if your rates are, you know, remain elevated for too long a period, it's going to hurt your economy. I mean, everybody loves to have low rates. Then asset prices will actually go up, you know, borrowing costs will be cheap, uh, business will be booming. But then if this result, resulted in high inflation, then you have no choice um, but to raise rates. So uh, I think uh, the scenario whereby the Fed will start to cut rates uh, would depends very much on the uh, how 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 fast the inflation can actually be uh, coming off right now. Mm, do you see this as a stagflation? 
Uh, good question. Uh, nobody has the answer. Uh, we will have to see because uh, we do not know whether this inflation is going to come down. You know, if it's going to be remaining stubbornly high over a prolonged, pro prolonged period of time, uh, yes, you will definitely be seeing a stagflation uh, for the whole global economy. Uh, that is one of the worst uh, scenario you would want to see. Mm. I would so rather let's... see you know, a recession and then you know, the, 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 the global economy just uh, bounce back from it. In, 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 you know, in, you know, instead of dragging uh, you know, over a prolonged period of time uh, with no growth and uh, you know, high inflation. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> um, the next question is by Farid Rahman. Mm -hmm. so, sure, so when recession strikes Malaysia, would it be better to invest in gold or invest in top KLCI counters, which give high dividend yield. So what would, what would be your pick? Okay. Uh, recession. Yes, it could be. Uh, um, okay. Actually, actually for, for recession, I think uh, the strategy is to buy bonds uh, and avoid equities. Uh, you also want to put quite a fair bit of your money in money market. Uh, to buy gold, gold is 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 a very dif different uh, ball game altogether. Um, is pretty much a safe haven uh, assets, uh, but the problem is uh, it is also affected by a lot more uh, variables than we can actually monitor la. So I think for a retail investors, uh, I would rather uh, make it uh, simple, i.e. Uh, you know, I, I, I tell myself how much uh, bullets I want to save, how much cash I want to want to save right now. Uh, and when uh, prices are coming off, uh, you, you can never, you can never, you know, pinpoint the bottom of the share price. Uh. So if you like particular stock, you, if you think the fundamentals are correct, you can actually start averaging down. Uh, you, you'll be surprised. Uh, big fund managers out there, that's the strategy uh, they're using because they know for sure nobody can actually pinpoint the bottom. So um, yes, you average down and as a momentum, then you go more uh, aggressively. Uh, as to putting part of your portfolio under gold, under foreign currency, under Bitcoin, I think it can become too complicated and uh, you know, difficult to manage, I would think. Mm, all right. So it seems that the US data has come out, inflation data has come down, it cools down to 6.5%. Uh, market rally. <laughs> <laughs> the the next question is what do you think about the US dollar uh US dollar direction? Uh? Will it continue to weaken against MYR? And what would be your house estimated range? Oh actually uh house view is uh, kind of aggressive. Uh, I think you can see it here, right? Uh, you might, uh yeah, we are but one of the more aggressive ones uh, we are looking at 4.11. Uh in a way we are kind of like implying that uh uh, US may may actually uh, more inclined towards uh, cutting rates towards the end of the year. La. This is actually not average. La. It's the year-end target of 4.11. I think consensus, you are talking about 4.3 uh, around that level. Uh, in other words, I think, uh, you know, we uh, as far as ringgit weakness is concerned, we already peaked uh, last year la, when it was like, you know, going down like nobody's business. La. I think uh, for EM currency as a whole, uh, we have all seen the worst for currency. Uh, I think uh, looking forward, uh, I, I think the expectation is that there could still be a bit of weakness at least uh, during the first and second quarter because uh, US is raising rates by 50 basis points, 75 basis points. Uh, our, our bank of Garo is only raising by 25. Uh, you know that, right? I mean, uh, the higher the, your, your, your OPR or your your target rates, then the stronger your currency can be because uh, that's when people actually put uh, money in your currency to actually enjoy the yield. So we are not raising as, we are, we are raising rates, but not as aggressively as compared to the Fed. That's why I think uh, our ringgit was still more on the weaker side, uh, maybe during first quarter and second quarter, but towards the uh, third and fourth quarter when the US rates already peak, um, expectation is that they're going to cut then that's when our ringgit will start to strengthen. So we are looking at end this year 4.11%. Oh, sorry, 4.11 uh, ringgit to one US dollar. Wow, 4.11. Hopefully it comes through. Yeah. <laughs> to Irish. 
So, yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, so what is your forecast for oil price? Uh, I'm I'm sure that you know when you price, when it comes yep. to four point one one, you factor into the oil price uh forecast. No. Uh. Uh. Okay. Oil price we we actually use uh US dollar. So in in that sense, it's already been reflected. Uh. So we are we have ref reflected a uh, slightly weaker uh, US dollar. Hmm. Right. Now, what is your view on the EV sector? It is one of the hot sectors that investors are looking at right now. Do you have uh, what is your view on the sector, and what are the any recommendation in terms of the EV related stocks? Yeah, I think I think right now EV stocks is still pretty much a concept play la. But I, I think at some point of time, your your solar also a concept play la, because uh, you know it, it, you may have to wait another two three years for whoever is uh, you know going to the, the sector to to see uh, earnings uh, uh, coming through. I don't think we have, uh, you know, very meaningful uh, EV stocks to buy at the moment. Uh. But uh, again, uh, it's a bit hard to be uh, justified on a fundamental basis, on earnings basis. But as a concept play, yes, you can actually do that. You can buy, uh, hoping that, uh, you know, it will come into play, then you can actually uh, cash out. Mm, all right. Yep. Um... The next question is why are the fun why are the financial stocks in Singapore stable and rising compared to ours on Bursa Malaysia that seems to be overweight? So that's a question. By Unfortunately, we don't cover Singapore, so uh, we don't have a view on this. <laughs> All right. Thank you we so are much. It's a local centric uh, broker. Mm. The next question is by Stephen. So um what do you think about Inari? I think recently Inari also faced the rumor that the Apple yep. is could be not outsourcing so much of her work to Broadcom. So what do you think about this company? Okay. Uh is uh number one. Uh I think for those who invested in Inari, it went to 450 and it now came down to about came down to about 280 prior to the sell-off uh two days ago. Uh I think uh, the share price performance is pretty much in line with uh, tech stock globally. Uh, I mean, you look at Tesla, it's actually down 70%. It's even worse than uh, Inari. Um, okay, for what happened over the last two days uh, is very simple. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, uh, Shane, uh, basically, uh, Apple want to insource a lot of their parts. Uh, they are actually no longer buying uh, certain parts from uh, Broadcom uh, because they are, sorry, uh, from the others, uh, Broadcom, uh, because they, they have developed internally. But what... Uh, Inari is actually doing its RF radio frequency is is a lot complicated uh, as compared to what uh, the 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 terminated uh, uh, from uh, Broadcom. I think the one is uh, more like Bluetooth uh, related. But but again, uh, stock market, uh, you know, when they see uh, A, uh, they will immediately jump to B and C. Uh, that's that's how stock market uh, work. Uh, stock market wants to be ahead of the curve. When Apple says that they are going to insource uh, their parts, even though they are not taking the one uh, Inari is actually making, uh, but you know you have to raise the risk premium for the stock. That will actually results in uh, lower stock valuation. Um, so uh, we actually downgraded uh, our fair value uh, this morning. One of the question which I think is quite relevant is that uh, you know someone actually posted question to my tech analyst. So, uh, you know, Mr. So-and-so, are you going to downgrade, uh, uh, you know, Inari every time uh, Apple comes out with uh, bad news? Uh, the answer is very simple. Uh, I think Inari is smart enough to know that uh, they will also have to do something, i.e. they want to diversify their customer base. So, assuming they can successfully diversify their customer base as well uh, from Apple, uh, given the fact that the know that uh, you know uh, Apple is actually per pursuing uh, more in, in insourcing over time, then yeah okay because uh, you know by then you would have uh, you know lock in uh, other customers to make sure that your product can actually sell. So uh, as far as share price performance, I think uh, all this tech stock is still uh, packed to uh, what you uh, can expect from Nasdaq, and Nasdaq. Um, the key driver for share prices is actually the interest rates in the US. Uh, I also got one interesting uh, question from a client recently. Uh, you know, he was suggesting that why, uh, you know, if 
if uh, US is to cut rates uh, uh, third quarter or even fourth quarter, then shouldn't, shouldn't we be buying tech stock now? Because the moment US cut, cut rates, uh, the tech stock will all, all, all be uh, running. See, the problem with that uh, theory is that uh, what if the Fed decide to prolong or to, to what if the rates are to remain high for longer, assuming inflation is not coming down, uh, then you could be jumping back into uh, tech stock a bit too low, too, sorry, too early. Uh, you may not actually see performance uh, immediately. La, or you may even uh, suffer uh, more capital you know, uh, loss uh, while waiting for you know, the cycle to turn. La. So in the end, uh, tech stock, uh, Inari included, uh, I think you have to watch uh, the narrative by the Fed uh, on uh, the direction of the rates in the US. Mm, all right. I, I think maybe I'll explain. I mean, to to sure. to uh, the audience also, uh, why uh, you know the market actually values uh, tech stock based on the interest rates in the US. You see, tech stock are basically high growth uh, companies. Their earnings right is back loaded, meaning that they may not be making so much money initially, but uh, you know over the longer time, their earnings can be growing exponentially. So if you are going to use PE to value this stock, you are actually uh, under, understated their value. So uh, what you do is you use DCF, you discount back their future earnings based on certain discount rate. Then this discount rate depends on the interest rates. So when interest rates is high, you actually have to apply a higher discount rate. When you apply a higher discount rate, you know, the, 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 the discounted value you get is actually lower. So as and when the rates started to fall, uh, you know, you, you apply a lower discount rate, then your valuation will actually go up. Uh, that actually basically happened, uh, you know, say about two years ago when uh, US interest rate was at zero. So, um, yeah, when you discount back all these potential future earnings with a very low discount rate, right? Certainly your, your, your Tesla or your Facebook would be worth a lot more. But now rates are becoming higher. That's why the value actually dropped. All right. Uh, yeah, we are running out of time. So let's do one last question, uh, Joshua. So sure. just now you talk about uh, ferro silicon, you talk about aluminium. So how about steel? What is your view on the steel companies like uh, Anju and so on? Okay, steel uh, is a bit tricky right now. Uh, I think uh, we can tell the steel prices are actually uh, uh, recovering uh, a little bit. Uh, but the problem is with uh, your power, your fuel, your, your power cost is also going up at the same time. Uh, I think they are not out of the wood at this point of time. Uh, a lot of them actually are holding um, a lot of inventory acquired at high prices. And you know, right now after the steel prices uh, have fallen, you are stuck with uh, inventory at high prices. So as and when you sell, you actually uh, you actually lose money. Uh, so you would still have to go through that phase. Uh, I think uh, steel companies, uh, steel, steel sector as a whole, the cycle is very short. Uh, right now, uh, given what I have seen, uh, there is still no uh, positive uh, turnaround as yet. I think they are still trying to deplete uh, some of their inventories acquired at high prices. All right, thank you so much, uh, Joshua, for doing this very engaging question and answer session with our audience today. So thank you so much for uh, sharing your perspective for the market outlook for 2022 and where are the investment opportunities and which sectors have the earnings resilience. Thank you so much, Joshua. Okay, thank you, uh, audience. And, and I wish you a uh, very happy uh, Chinese New Year for those who are celebrating Chinese New Year. Thank you. All right, so let me share my okay. screen. So uh, for those of you who haven't had uh, Kananga share trading account, you may uh, go to this link, which is uh, which I've given you in the uh, chat group. So dco.kananga.com.my forward slash create dash account uh, forward slash open dash account dash overviews forward slash EB. So if you want to open a share trading account with Kananga, please uh, fill up this form and your account will be open online. So if you want to join a Kananga Trade to Win Telegram channel, this is a link you can uh, click to join the Kananga Trade to Win Telegram channel. In the Telegram channel, you have a lot of trading ideas on what to buy and what to sell. 
And, uh, and one more thing is that uh, after this webinar, we'll also email you a survey form and we'll appreciate you to give us your feedback uh, into how this session has been conducted. So uh, let us know what's your feedback for this webinar. And last but not least, we also have the CanTrade 2.0 mobile app all right so this country 2.0 mobile apps is uh, is launched and is uh, downloadable on uh, app store and google play so this uh, new app is revamped and so that you can trade the busan malaysia singapore and hong kong market yes a lot of improved features like you have uh, it has a uh, improved user interface with biometric authentication login it has the e-payment and e-settlement services available it enables a lot of orders and also stop limit orders it also enable you to do a set up price alert and receive notifications so that you won't miss any opportunity. It enables you to track your portfolio and detailed account summary on the go. It also provides investors with theoretical open and the closing price. It gives you access to the trading view chart and calculator. It has a push notification on trade match and IPO first day listing. It's go green. You can download your statement on the contract note on the uh, mobile app. So you can download it on uh, App Store, Google Play Store, and also Huawei App Gallery. So just go to these uh, three areas, three apps, so you can download the CanTrade 2.0 mobile trading app. So with that, we have concluded the session uh, today. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, you just heard from the head of research uh, of Kananga Investment Bank, Mr. Joshua Ng. So we thank you so much for uh, staying tuned until the end of this webinar. And may all of you here have a prosperous uh, Chinese New Year. And for those of you who are not celebrating, uh, happy holiday uh, next week. All right, bye everybody. So see you in our next CanTrade webinar.